Batman is famous for getting himself out of impossible situations, and in Batman 130, Batman finds himself fighting against a killer robot named Failsafe that his alter ego built as a contingency plan for himself that accidentally goes off. Failsafe quickly takes over Gotham City, takes down any Justice Leaguer that dares to challenge him, and after raiding Atlantis where Batman was formerly hiding, Failsafe quickly finds that Batman has transported himself all the way up to the Justice League base on the moon, but it only takes a short amount of time before Failsafe steals a ship and crashes it near the base, where it starts chasing Batman all over the station. That is until Batman reverses a teleporter sending Failsafe back to the surface, while Batman himself dangles help Helplessly in space with no way back. So what do you do? Well, Batman calls a destroyed ship over to him, takes out its oxygen tank, and rips out one of the thrusters for him to ride on top of for all 238,900 miles back to Earth. Even worse is Batman passes out during the ride, waking up as he free falls through Earth's atmosphere, using his cape to both cover his mouth and slow down his ascent until he crashes like a missile near Superman's Fortress of Solitude, where Batman walks in, and they immediately prepare for one final showdown. I mean, Batman's done some crazy stuff, but casually telling Robin he just fell from the moon might take the cake for now. But a feat that's far more hilarious is when Goku and Vegeta go to train with Whis on Beerus' planet. The pair are subjected to the most grueling training they've ever gone through, which first includes them wearing these giant weighted suits that they hobble around in like the Pillsbury Doughboy, that while having no reported weight are so dang heavy that after taking the thing off, you can just watch them sink through the ground in the planet. And the funny thing is, even as Rachida and Goku continue on with their conversation, these things just don't stop sinking throughout the entire conversation, and most likely afterwards too. And apparently this is just a warm-up, because as the training continues, Beerus's angel Whis puts Goku and Rachida on a purple road, where the two must simply pick up a pair of weights, which either of them can hardly do. I mean, they can barely get the darn things in the air. And to make matters way worse, once both of them have successfully picked them up, Whis then tells the two to run a lap around the planet. Given that Beerus' planet isn't very big, it's still a tall order. Vegeta remarks that's impossible, as Whis says you better hope it's possible, and begins to erase the ground behind them to motivate the two to begin waddling as fast as they can. And if they should move too slow and fall, they're told they'll fall into another dimension and not be able to return. But as hard as this is, the one superhero who can never seem to catch a break is none other than our favorite wall crawler himself. You see, in Spider-Man's comics, he's considered to be able to lift up to 20 tons, and no more, except the one time that a tunnel underneath the East River full-on collapsed, with nothing but Spider-Man holding up the weight of the tunnel and the entire East River from crushing everyone in it. As help arrived, they immediately panicked and thought Spider-Man was tearing down the tunnel on everyone, with someone finally speaking up, telling the rescue crew to help them and Spider-Man who saved their lives. But Spider-Man's luck doesn't get much better when in another issue the lizard attempts to cure himself, which would be great, except for the fact that his lab equipment had been rigged with explosives and not wanting to hear it, the lizard ends up crashing an entire train station down on Spider-Man, with Spider-Man saying that it's so heavy that even Thor and the Hulk wouldn't be able to lift it. So still thinking that he doesn't stand a chance, Spider-Man manages to lift the entire thing upwards and throws it off of himself, and with his luck he'll probably get blamed for tearing down the subway station for fun. Now, Doom Guy is certainly one of the coolest characters out there, and it turns out part of his motivation to punish the hordes of demons he tears through is because they killed his pet rabbit. That's right, before Doom Guy left for his first major assignment on Mars, he went to a pet shop and bought himself a new best friend in the form of a rabbit that he aptly named Daisy. Doom Guy eventually left to be stationed as a security guard for the experiments that were going on, leaving Daisy with his wife while he was away. But tragically, after the Mars incident happened, and Doom Guy returned to an Earth being overrun by demons, he gets back to his hometown in time to find that Daisy has been murdered and mutilated by the demons who put her head on a spike. After mourning Daisy's death and that of his family, Doom Guy took Daisy's foot as a reminder of the innocence that was lost that day, and not for luck because he clearly doesn't need it, and still carries the foot around with them to this day. The Luke Skywalker created after Return of the Jedi, before Disney got their hands on him, is nothing short of a 
remarkable. From manipulating black holes to destroying entire invading armies with a single force push, Luke was also terrifying when it came to a skill called force speed. Normally we see Jedi like Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon use force speed to run really fast, but Luke on the other hand who found himself fighting against an entire invading galaxy and eventually a force demon that had been in prison for thousands of years, but eventually to Luke's luck the demon once called the Mother escapes for good. So what's Luke to do? Except train himself to not only be able to use the force to speed himself up, but also train himself to be able to slow down everything around him as well, and combine this force freezing ability with force speed to make himself unbeatable in any situation. Because when you're the most powerful Jedi ever, you totally can. But likely way more memorable is when Darth Vader and his troops were fighting against the people of Mustafar. Outnumbering the Imperial forces 10 to 1, the Mustafarians thought it would be an easy win, except they didn't know who Darth Vader was. In an attempt to completely wipe out the Imperial garrison, the people of Mustafar managed to redirect and unleash a literal entire sea's worth of lava onto the Imperials. The lava rushed towards the surprise Imperials who quickly found their entire garrison engulfed in it, including Vader who was now floating far below the surface, with his suit telling him that he was about to die. As the Mustafarians cheered at their victory, Vader used the force to create a sort of force shield as he ripped and pulled the head of an AT-AT towards him. Then using all his power, Vader managed to jump off of the AT-AT and shot himself out of the lava as the only survivor of the battle, using the force to easily put out the remaining flames before crushing the remaining army. But speaking of impossible situations, we come back to Goku. In the fabled Tournament of Power, where the 12 universes fight each other for survival, Goku and the androids find themselves facing off against the remaining warriors of Universe 2, who are lying on their somehow awesome power power of love, create a singularity and make an artificial black hole that absorbs ki and is also in the shape of a giant heart. This love attack is so strong it even surprises the destroyer god of their universe. They then send this giant heart on top of the androids and Goku, who find themselves unable to move or even teleport out. Goku acknowledges how strong their power is, but says that fortunately his chosen power of fury and guts is stronger, as he stands up and shoots his signature Kamehameha out of the heart disintegrating it and blasting the remaining warriors of Universe 2 off of the stage, or unfortunately, their universe now gets erased. Okay, now this one may be a bit of a mute point, as Superman is supposed to be a guy with really no limits, but in one issue, Superman was actually scared that he may not have enough strength to beat several new emerging villains, and decides, for the first time in his life, he needs to work out. So Superman goes to visit his friend, Dr. Shea Virtus, who had created several new machines to basically act as weight equipment for the big guy. Superman quickly goes to work tearing through these new machines and ends up bench pressing the equivalent of the entire weight of the Earth for five days straight, and to his sheer joy, ends up sweating for what seems to be the first time in his life, with the doctor being eager to collect it along with something else. But Soups being Soups has to leave to shower, shave, and make it to work within the next six seconds, so who can blame him for leaving in a hurry? One of those encounters that we all wonder what would happen is if Tony Stark were to ever go up against Magneto, which honestly doesn't really leave much of what would go down between the two to the imagination. But this fight actually does happen. When the all-powerful Phoenix Force is coming back to Earth, the Avengers and X-Men end up arguing over how to handle the situation, with Avengers like Tony Stark fearing the end of the world, while members of the X-Men and Magneto thought it would bring them their salvation. But luckily, Iron Man was prepared for the situation, having devised a series of armors to take on the X-Men, including just one for Magneto, that was made out of carbon nanotubes, aka not metal. Iron Man quickly takes the offensive to playing magnets and such to disrupt Magneto's powers, who easily swipes away everything Tony throws at him, which causes Tony to use his greatest weapon, being a chain of satellites he had sent all the way to Jupiter to tap into its magnetic field, and uses it to supercharge his armor, which unfortunately still fails, as Magneto reaches out from Earth and crushes the satellites, and to show Tony who he's messing with, reaches further out into the cosmos, channeling the magnetic power from every planet he can find into himself, only for him to discover that the Phoenix Force is destroying some of these planets, and Tony's totally right, as Iron Man then runs up and knocks him out, ending the fight. Even if this fight was a little bit ridiculous, it pales to the next one, where Batman ends up fighting against the Hulk in hand to 
hand-to-hand combat. In one of the first ever crossovers between DC and Marvel that saw Superman meet Spider-Man and Batman meeting the Hulk, you think some of these fights would be pretty one-sided, and you would be mostly correct. When Bruce Banner finds himself attempting to break into Wayne Enterprises to take a look at Bruce's new gamma gun, he suddenly finds that all the employees are going crazy as the building is being filled with Joker's laughing gas. As the Joker's henchmen grab Bruce Banner, they soon regret their decision. Unfortunately for Batman, who soars into the room, as the Joker walks in and convinces the Hulk that Batman is the one behind the break-in, Batman basically has to run around the room as he quickly realizes punching the Hulk does next to nothing, until the Hulk manages to catch him in a bear hug. Now before the Hulk can snap his spine like a twig, Batman strikes the nerves in the Hulk's ears and then hits him with a powerful sleeping grenade. Before the Hulk decides to hold his breath, and Batman decides to kick him in the solar plexus as hard as he can to make the Hulk breathe in the gas, calming him down and ending the fight. And hey, if you like these ridiculous feats, then you might want to check out these insane ones in this video only on Trick Theory.